thank you guys so much for the introduction. And uh, I have to say awesome to the person who traded in 2010. I got into crypto um, actually because of maybe some of you even, but um, because of our students actually coming to me saying, you teach entrepreneurial finance, why not cryptocurrencies? And so we started actually a class on fintech ventures um, through which actually then my interest in, in crypto really um, accelerated if you want. Um, so very nice to be with, with you today. Um, and what I want to show you is some work that I have been doing with you know, kind of co-authors of mine as well um, on how we can use the data from the Bitcoin blockchain or any other blockchain to learn more about the participants in the market. Um, you know, this is actually something that um, to, to me as a research project was, was or as a project was really um, core to understanding more about crypto because as you will see um, in, in what I want to talk to you about today is to, to show you some um, of the, the powerful applications of cryptocurrencies in terms of how we can use that data and also some of the limitations um, where in a way we still have to invest in the infrastructure um, of, of the crypto universe. Yeah? Um, so, you know, the, this is obviously quite timely. We are, you know, in a, in a time where there's a lot of discussion about cryptocurrencies. Um, there has been lots of volatility. There has been a recent crash, right, um, in, in Terra Luna. So um, this is really a time where we need to understand how to actually think about the integration and adoption of cryptocurrency um, in a smart way into the traditional financial system and where... Um, the fault lines, if you want, lie, and where the opportunities are. And I want to show you, um, in some sense, how data from the blockchain can help us with, with some of that. All right. So, you know, kind of, I know, um, you know, outside the weather is nice and, and you don't want to have an academic lecture, so I didn't want to go too deeply into any of the details, but just, you know, kind of the, as a really broad-based overview, right, the... Um, Okay, that doesn't work. Um, the, the promise and premise of cryptocurrencies and, and so blockchain, right, is really um, to invert the architecture of the financial system um, by, um, by um, getting rid of centralized financial intermediaries as much as possible, right, and having um, a centralized digital, uh, sorry, a distributed ledger technology that allows us um, to actually have data stored in many different nodes. So this is the, the red uh, picture in the bottom here, right? Which actually allows people um, and, and uh, participants to enter this type of blockchain um, ledger without having to rely on centralized intermediaries. Now, it is true, and I will come back to this in a second, is that actually in the Bitcoin universe, um, exchanges as centralized hubs do play a very important role, right? Um, but this is actually something that's relatively unique um, in Bitcoin, right? And, and in um, in the, the Bitcoin trading universe, um, if you compare it maybe to, um, to, to DeFi, which today is obviously not my topic. All right, so having said this, right, what, what I want to show you is how, bit, how we can use Bitcoin blockchain data um, to analyze some of the most important participants in this marketplace. And the, the, the things I will show you is number one, how we can, what we can learn about the the network structure of Bitcoin, and in particular, which ones are the most important hubs, the money that flows through them, the traceability of that money. And then I also want to show you how the composition and the concentration of some of the biggest participants in that network look like, um, in particular, the largest holders of Bitcoin and the miners. And as you know, right, the miners are basically um, these enti entities that validate transactions on the blockchain and encode transactions on the blockchain. And of course, it's important to understand how concentrated the mining capacity is because um, famously, right, if miners were too concentrated, if more than 51% of 
hashing capacity was in the hand of either one miner or colluding set of miners um, that could give rise potentially to a 51% attack, right? Or basically an attack on the blockchain that might undermine its integrity. And so, you know, this is what we want to learn about um, from this type of analysis. Now, let me show you, you know, kind of if, if um, anything comes out of this talk, <laughs> maybe this one thing you will remember, which is basically I wanted to show you what a digital footprint on the Bitcoin blockchain looks like. And by the way, I should say, I see some people taking a photo. I make the slides, you know, put the slides online so you don't have to, to do this if you don't want. <laughs> Um, right, so how does the transaction on the blockchain actually look like? If you look at the top panel here, right, this is actually a Bitcoin transaction. And I'm sorry, I don't know why this doesn't work. Um, but, you know, if you look at the top panel, you see on the left, right, um, this string, 17A, 16Q, blah, 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 right? This is one address that has 1,388 Bitcoin sitting in it, right? Not bad. Um, and it's sending... Right? So to the right is where the, where the money gets sent to. It is sending actually 0.01 BTC to this address 1F8D blah, blah, blah. Yeah? But then you see in the lowest, um, in the lowest line there, um, actually most of the money, 1,388 and a bit, gets sent back to 17A16 and so on. Why is this? Actually, that's important to understand because the Bitcoin ledger doesn't store um, balances. It only stores transactions. So in every transaction, whatever is in an address, everything has to be sent. Otherwise, right, we wouldn't fully account for it on the blockchain. Why is, and then, you know, kind of that's important to understand. Now, what is also important to understand, I picked a transaction here that indeed kept the same address. So I can easily show you that the 1,388 went back to myself, if you want, right? Like I put it from the left to the right pocket. But many wallet protocols would not do that. What they would do is that for every transaction, you generate a new address. And because everything is anonymous, it would then be actually difficult for me to know, as a researcher or anyone else, right? Did this other 1,388 go back to myself? Or did I send it to, right, in the same transaction, even to someone else? That is really important because that was one of the first things we had to solve, or we have to solve, when looking at transactions and volume on the blockchain. Because I don't want to confuse volume that's just me, right, reshuffling my money to myself with actually BTC being sent to truly somebody else, yeah? Now, you can say, but then isn't it hopeless? Because, right, every time this gets sent to someone else, how would you know who this belongs to? But there is one piece of how the Bitcoin uh, protocol works that helps me here. And this is the second transaction I want to show you. So look at this transaction. What you see here is, you see there are these five different addresses, 3EO, blah, 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 and so on, right? And you see that combinedly, in this transaction, 0.71 BTC are being sent to one other entity, right? But, and here comes the trick, the fact that all these addresses on the left are being used in one transaction together means that the same entity is controlling all these five addresses. Otherwise, they couldn't pull all these transactions together, sorry, all the money from these different addresses together and send it to whoever this is on the right, yeah? Now, why is this powerful when I look at uh, Bitcoin transaction is because this indicates to me um, that it's the same entity controlling these five addresses. And therefore, right, I can not only pull these five addresses together into a wallet and say this is the same thing, right, but then I can build a full tree and a graph of any address, right, that has ever been used with any of those fives. And anything else that has, you see, um, iteratively, I can basically pull all the addresses together that have ever been used um, in transactions together. And, you know, and with this, actually, it allows me to cluster, if you want, the addresses that are being set in, up in different transactions that belong to one entity. 
But, and this is you know, why I'm going through this so painfully tediously, right? But what you see with this is that if I know this is how the blockchain works, so does everyone else who uses it. And the fact, right, what you can see is that if somebody who has BTC sitting on the blockchain wants to avoid that anyone can ever actually know that a certain set of addresses are controlled by the same person or entity, they can actually avoid ever in a way showing their hand. Because what they can do is to make really pains painstakingly clear or take care of the fact that they never use some of the addresses they control in the same transaction. Yeah? And therefore, then it would be impossible for anyone to know that the same person or entity controls certain type of addresses. And it also means that whatever I'm going to show you now as results, um, you know, is in a way an underestimate of the concentration of ownership or mining power and so on on the, on the blockchain if some of the largest holders or the largest miners don't want anyone to be able to trace um, how much ultimately they have. Yeah? So that's important to understand because that's one of the limitations that is somewhat difficult to pierce for anyone yeah? just on the blockchain. It's also important to understand, yes, of course, there have been situations where the FBI was able to just get somebody's password and then basically get into their wallet. But that's not through the blockchain. This is through, in a way, being able to go to you know, the browser that this person uses or you know, kind of the cell phone and so on. Yeah? So this is obviously different, um, a different access, and that's not the type of investigation, obviously, that I do as an academic. Yeah. Um, so, but it's important to understand, right, this type of clustering that I just explained allows me to at least, you know, to the best of possibility to approximate or to, to cluster all the addresses that belong together um, in one, to one wallet and one entity. But that still hasn't allowed me to pierce the veil of um, anonymity, right? And so in order to do this, what we had to do is what we did is we went and we collected any known addresses from um, all different sources, including public sources like Wallet Hub, Reddit, Bitcoin Talk, and so on. We also um, set up accounts um, with some of the biggest exchanges from Coinbase to Gemini and so on, because as soon as you interact with them, you get an address from them. And remember, then once I have one of the addresses, say of the cold wallet of Coinbase, I can cluster it with everything else I see on the blockchain. In addition, we also work with uh, Bitfury uh, Crystal Blockchain, which is one of the leading providers of anti-money laundering, um, you know, and uh, software and analytics um, to, to complement our, our list of, um, of entities. And so with this, we have basically the um, most complete um, database of entities that stand behind these Bitcoin transactions um, that have been put together to this point. And in particular, right, you can see we have many of the most important entities, meaning almost 400 um, exchanges, such as, right, Gemini, Coinbase, Binance, Bit, um, Bitflyer, and so on. Um, ransomware, I mean, illegal things like ransomware attackers, darknet marketplaces, and so on as well. Um, and gambling sites, online wallet providers, etc. So let me show you now with this data, what can we do in a way, what can we learn about um, the Bitcoin universe? So the first piece I want to show you is basically how transactions and the parties involved in Bitcoin transactions um, interact. And so this is just, you know, kind of from 2015 to um, the end of 2021, and we have now extended it to 2022 too, but it doesn't change very much. What you can see basically is this is money transactions on chain, right, on the Bitcoin blockchain that are flowing to different entities. And so the darkest um, blue bar or purplish bar is, is are exchanges for whom I know the name, right? Where I have identified the wallet, I know this is the cold or hot wallet, not the cold wallet typically, but the hot wallet, say of Coinbase, of Gemini, of any of the known exchanges. The slightly uh, lighter blue 
above are OTC brokers, um, you know, kind of uh, smaller exchanges for which we might not know the name, but that we can identify through the structure of their transaction because they look very different. Um, and then the orange bars on top is basically money flowing from exchanges back to their clients. And you can see almost 80% of volume on the Bitcoin blockchain is really in is somehow involving exchanges, meaning it's for trading, speculation, investment purposes. Very, very little, and that is the yellowish bar in the middle, is for non-trading related activities. In particular, um, say, miners cashing out, um, you know, illegal, I I involving illegal or ransomware addresses and so on. Um, and this is, again, not to say that illegal activity on the blockchain should be taken lightly. I'm not at all saying this. I just want to show you that the valuations of cryptocurrency, in particular blockchain, that bit, sorry, Bitcoin that we're seeing, it's very unlikely that the valuation is somehow supported by everybody betting that this will just be for an illegal transaction. Right? I mean, the, given that this is by the end of 2021, um, around 0.5% of all transaction value, volume. That seems kind of weird if, you know, all the, the value is basically based on such a small sliver of the activity that we see going on, right? Now, having said this, right, so clearly exchanges, at least for Bitcoin, play a very important role. By the way, for those of you who are more familiar with this universe, you also know, right, that when you say, if you interact with a centralized exchange, like say Coinbase, you are actually sending your Bitcoin, say if you had it in a self-hosted wallet, you are sending it to the exchange and you are forfeiting it, right? You, because it goes into the wallet of the exchange and you now have to basically trust that they are doing the right thing in their accounting. But why is that important here is because you, you might ask, as soon as Bitcoin goes into the wallet of the exchange, whatever trading happens on the centralized exchange is not on the blockchain, right? It gets basically netted on what have you in the wallet of the exchange. And so just to give you a sense, we did actually an analysis where we compared week by week the amount of on-chain wallets to exchange wallets that I can see with the off chain, meaning right on the books of the, of the centralized exchanges volume, and actually the correlation week to week is almost 50%, um, and the magnitude um, of volume is about 1.5 times off exchange, sorry, off chain to what it is on chain, but it does tell you that actually a lot of volume that flows to the exchanges seems to be to then trade Right? And in a way, um, li create liquidity for the, bi the Bitcoins that you're holding. So the reason why I want to point this out is that um, it does seem that whenever somebody sends money to an exchange, it's with the purpose of trading. It's not so much that, you know, you, because you could send it there and let it sit, right, on the centralized exchange for quite a bit of time, but that doesn't seem to be the case. Yeah? All right. Cool. Um, so now, um, I do want to uh, show you one uh, thing more quick, uh, quickly um, about the network structure. And so beyond that, just showing you that the exchanges are important, actually, um, we did a graph analysis to, sh to show you how important as nodes these exchanges are on the Bitcoin blockchain. So we use graph analysis here. Um, to, to show you in the, the blue balls and the size of it shows you how much volume goes through the different um, nodes here. And what you can see is that out of the very largest, so I'm, I'm plotting for you here, only nodes that had more than 500,000 BTC flow through them over a two year period. But you can see, right? You can say maybe not surprisingly, the very biggest exchanges whose no names I'm sure you all know are also the biggest nodes. But what is also very interesting here is that they are forming an almost complete graph. So what this means is that they're actually all com completely interconnected. 
even independent of the jurisdictions that they are sitting in. So, you know, kind of right Binance is in Hong Kong, um, you know, say, um, Bit, bit, um, bit Flyer, for example, is also in Asia, you know, um, Binance or Kraken and Gemini are in the US, uh, sorry, Coinbase and, and Kraken Gemini in the US, right? But despite the jurisdiction and the location they're sitting in, there's massive cross, there are massive cross flows. Now, why is that important, actually? That is important for two reasons. On the one hand, it shows us that, at least in the Bitcoin universe, the, there, there are actually these centralized nodes, ultimately, if you want, right? The exchanges through which, a lot, through which a lot of volume is flowing. And you could say that maybe that's actually for purposes of anti-money laundering, verification, KYC, just basically having um, you know, basic regulation to protect the financial system, maybe that's a good thing because as long, you know, kind of it, it could suggest that if these exchanges are willing to, um, you know, check their customers and not allow drug dealers and oligarchs and, and other entities to interact in our um, financial system, right, then we have at least one way of, um, of actually providing, um, you know, some, some verification of IDs here, yeah? But unfortunately, it's not as easy as that. And the reason is the following. So here, this is just to give you a proof of concept, is what we do here is we take the biggest known dark web market, Hydra market, um, that, for example, also last month, the U.S. Um, basically uh, censored it and, and qualified it as, uh, you know, kind of a, um, a terrorist organization. Um, so, on Hydra, you can trade anything that is disgusting and unpleasant. Um, but we know the addresses that belong to Hydra. And what we can then do is to look to see where money flows that comes out or into these addresses that belong to the dark web. And the interesting thing that you see in this picture is, if I look at the direct flows, you see the only big bubbles here are places like Bitslato, local Bitcoin, Binance, and so on. Basically, um, uh, exchanges that are not really doing KYC and AML enforcement. Yeah? Um, and say, you know, I don't even know if you can see it, but say Gemini or Coinbase, the bubbles are tiny of the direct flows because they are doing AML and KYC enforcement. And so they would stop anything that comes directly out of Hydra and would not allow it into the exchange. The problem, however, is the following. What we can also see is you see all these turquoise nodes, um, you know, surrounded here. Those are basically pass-through or mixing addresses where money flows out of Hydra into right, an anonymous address, get mixed with other BTC, and then is actually sent into Coinbase and Gemini as well. And so a lot of these indirect flows go actually back into what we were hoping is a regulated financial market. Yeah? Um, and so this is one of the big challenges that we still have in um, trying to figure out how to keep, say, you know, this part of the financial system from being used and exploited um, for purposes that, as a society, we have deemed as unpleasant, right? Um, and I want to say the same is, by the way, also true. So the same transaction that I just described, you could do for, evade, for tax evasion as well, right? Um, so this is, in my mind, right, some, one of the central things we need to solve um, because otherwise, right, if we allow one part of the financial um, system to evade taxes, to evade all the enforcement that we impose on all the other intermediaries, we're giving obviously a massive cross-subsidy to one part of the system that we're not giving to everyone else. Um, and so what would happen in every financial system where smart people are involved? Everything would obviously go to, to the unregulated part. But then we would have to give up, say, collecting um, taxes or, right, we would have to be willing to open ourselves up to all these tainted flows that normally we don't like, right? Um, so, you know, to me, this is actually a really important um, decision that society has to take and, and our economy, right, has to be aware of. Um, 
you know, I have some other work where we're suge suggesting ways how one could solve this, with, which goes a little be, bit beyond today, but, you know, kind of this is actually, um, you know, kind of one important, if you want, unsolved solution. And I think, you know, there are huge opportunities to actually think about how we want to handle um, identity verification in the you know, in our society in general, right? And so this is maybe um, focusing us um, and making it really urgent to, to think about it, right? Cool. So this is one piece that I wanted to show you. Um, now, you know, in our remaining few minutes, let me then go on and show you how some of the other important entities on the blockchain, um, you know, look like and interact. So here, um, the, the, the second piece I want to show you is now the ownership concentration of participants in the blockchain, right? So far I've showed you flows, now I have to get at stocks, right? Um, to do this, you might say, right, all of you who know, um, you know, in particular those of you who have traded it, you know there's something called the rich list, which is a very watched list in, in the Bitcoin universe, right? It's basically the biggest addresses, um, and there are lots of whale alerts that, you know, kind of um, identify when one of the biggest wallets start actually moving some of its money and so on. But actually the rich list per se doesn't tell you much about concentration. Why? Because the very biggest addresses are things like Binance and Gemini and so on, which, right, we just discussed, holds Bitcoin on behalf of many, many people. And so it would be very misleading if I showed you just, oh, look, it looks very concentrated, but a lot of it might not be because it's on behalf of many people, yeah? Um, so the first thing we had to do is, is differentiate um, intermediary wallets from individual wallets. Um, and, you know, obviously for the intermediaries that I know, say for example these 400 exchanges and so on, it's easy, I even know their name, I just, right, take, uh, classify them as intermediary, but there are many smaller intermediaries that I might not have identified, but I, don't, I want to err on the side of being careful, right, being conservative and not overstating concentration, right, and so that's what we did is basically by looking at the structure of transactions that different wallets and clusters um, display, we classified, right, anything that even remotely looks like an intermediary address as an intermediary, and then we are calculating concentration of individual entities based on this characterization. And so let me show you then what we find when we do this. Um, so this is kind of as of the end of 2020, but, you know, we just redid this for as of the end of 2022 and it looks very similar. So this first is just to give you a baseline. This is the level of all the balances of BTC held in the wallets of intermediaries as of um, 2020. Um, and what you see here is that about 5.5 million BTC by the end of 2020 are held in intermediary wallets. By the way, this is a time when about 18 million BTC were in, in circulation. Yeah? Now, let's compare this to the known individual um, ownership. And here on the left, I show you... Sorry. My mic seems to be coming in and out. Um, on the left, I show you basically the same, how the balances, um, you know, were, were accumulated, right? Um, and if you look at the top um, blue panel, what you can see is basically this tells you the date at which first one of these very large whale addresses was established. And it, it's basically also to show you that not all the big whales are people who started in 2009, right, and bought into Bitcoin really early. What you can see, actually, there are several peaks in 2014, 2000, end of 2017, and so on, right? So there are many whale addresses that were actually established um, even when the price of Bitcoin was already very high, yeah? But just, in a way, participation and even, you know, participation of very large owners um, has been established, over, you know, kind of, or have been accumulated over time. Now, maybe more interestingly, if you look on the right um, of the panel, what you can see, is this gives you a snapshot of ownership concentration as of tw end of 2020. And what this tells you, actually, is um, that, say, if you look, the largest 
6,000 addresses on the Bitcoin blockchain control about um, 3 million BTC. And the largest 10,000 addresses control actually a bit more than 5 million BTC. So as much as all the intermediary wallets together, yeah, um, that I showed you before. And so the, um, you know, in some sense, right, what this actually suggests that um, the, the participation in that Bitcoin universe is actually very concentrated and that, that actually the, often the narrative of Bitcoin being this big force for democratization and for leveling the playing field of lifting everybody's boats and allowing you know, small people to benefit from this system doesn't really kind of seem to play out with the reality. Now you can say, I see lots of people like shrugging, right? I mean, you can say that, yes, maybe that was naive in the first place to think that, you know, kind of inequality can be solved in such a simple, cheap way. I, I agree, right? I mean, in a way you, you can't, it would have been surprising if, say, Bitcoin in itself would have solved this problem of inequality we have. But we also need to be realistic, right, about, you know, kind of where it has left us. And, and, at least as of now, the concentration is really very high. Why is this, again, right, why is this important? Um, by the way, just in order to benchmark this for you, um, you know, we, we've been talking now for more than a decade, right, about how concentrated wealth and, sorry, and unequal wealth is in the U.S., but actually if you use wealth um, distribution in the U.S. as a benchmark for the concentration of Bitcoin wealth, you can see that Bitcoin is actually tenfold more unequal than U.S. wealth distribution. So I'm, you know, using here data from Zayas and Sukman, who, um, you know, have done a lot of work on the concentration of wealth and the wealth inequality in the U.S. And they have calculated that if you take all in, including housing wealth and everything, right, um, the, to the top 0.1% of the U.S. In wealth distribution hold about 16% of all wealth in the U.S. economy. But the 0.01% of Bitcoin holders hold 26%. So you see, right, this is um, even an order of magnitude bigger. Now, why is this important ultimately, right? On the one hand, it's because Bitcoin is not our cheap get out of jail card for income inequality, right? That's clear in this data. But it, sorry, but it's also important to understand because any further adoption of Bitcoin, say through um, institutions, you know, um, putting money into Bitcoin or allowing people in their 401k programs um, to put money into, you know, kind of into cryptocurrency, these, any price appreciation that comes from order flow will actually benefit a very select few people, but not the entirety um, of, of U.S. savers and retail investors, right? So this is something to keep in mind. Um, you know, kind of, I personally feel that if we want people to be able to, you know, kind of take risk and, and speculate on things like Bitcoin, as long as they do it on, you know, kind of, any money that they deem is possible to, to speculate on, that's fine, but we might not want actually to allow retirement saving, savers um, to invest basically in a cryptocurrency um, where, you know, as, as I'm sure you all are aware, right, not only do we still have a lot of volatility and we haven't solved all these governance problems that I, I just um, showed you, right, um, but also we need to be aware it will have it will, if anything, increase inequality, right, in, in returns than leveling it. All right. So lastly, let me show you um, what we can learn about miners. Why this, obviously, as we said, is really important as well, is that mining concentration um, will affect how much we believe or how much we can bank on the future integrity of the Bitcoin blockchain. Now... I'm sure you all know, right, that um, basically miners um, typically pool in what is called mining pools, which are these loose combination um, or collaborations of miners. And the reasons why we have mining pools is that actually it, 
the Bitcoin protocol economically, if you want, has in economic um, incentive built, built in that miners um, or that size gets rewarded because um, when you try to solve a hashing problem on the blockchain, right, it is typically the case, I mean, or it is the case that you cannot be sure whether you win the hashing game or not. And so this, you know, kind of stochasticity leads to the fact that um, as a miner, you would like to co-insure co yourself with other miners, right? As long as you're working on a block, one of them might win the block and then, um, you know, kind of they basically have compensation contracts that allows all the miners that have been working on a block to receive compensation for it independent of whether you are the one lucky one who, who won it or not. Yeah? This is why um, miners actually typically cluster together in mining pools. Now, we know a lot about the concentration of mining pools because you know, there are many websites, including crypto.com and so on, right, that, that um, report the concentration of mining pools and even where they are registered and so on. But it's important to understand that mining pools are not necessarily miners, right? The mining capacity could be controlled by other entities that have nothing to do with the mining pools. And depending on how the distribution of mining capacity looks like, the, the power on the blockchain might be in the hand of the miners, not the mining pools. Yeah, so it is the case, and so this picture is, you know, not, not our data, but, you know, but it's free, you can download it from, from any crypto website, right? You can see that the largest seven or eight mining pools control easily 70% of mining capacity. But again, right, that doesn't yet tell me whether actually the crypto universe is very concentrated in terms of the mining capacity. And so what we did is we used our blockchain data to trace basically Bitcoin from the coin uh, uh, base, you know, reward collection data uh, addresses all the way to the miners. So what you see right on the very top, you know, kind of the, the pinkish node, this is the example here is Antpool, which is one of the biggest uh, miners, right? And that's basically the address in which it receives it co its Coinbase reward. So the reward for, for mining a Bitcoin and winning the, the, the block race, right? But then, right, what happens, say, in, in, in pool is they're collecting it in this address and then they're sending it, if you want, down into this yellowish nodes where the money gets stored for some time until several blocks have been won. And then, as you can see here, quite hierarchically, they send it then down into these blue nodes. So, by the way, nothing is colorful on the blockchain, right? I'm just doing this here um, to, to keep track of this stuff. Um, so, they're sending it basically into this reward distribution addresses from which then it's actually sent to the, the addresses of individual miners. Yeah? And so, I can basically trace through... Um, be, um, in then identifying how big the individual miners are because I can see how much Bitcoin they receive, right? And there is, um, you know, a translation, if you want, um, of how much Bitcoin you receive to the hashing power that you're bringing to the block. And then, you know, we can do this basically for all the largest mining pools um, that, that we have on the Bitcoin blockchain, and that's what we did. So having done this, um, let me then quickly show you what we have learned about concentration of the Bitcoin blockchain, uh, of miners on the Bitcoin blockchain. Um, and focus, if you focus on the right um, graph here, um, what I'm pl plotting for you is, is the number of miners that it takes in a given month to control, say, 50% of mining capacity. So the blue line is the 50% line, the red line is the 40% line, and so on, yeah? Um, and what you can see, basically, is if you look at the end of 2021, right, you see that about, you know, 55 miners control 50% of mining capacity, yeah? That's, you know, and then you have to think about, is 55 a lot, right, in terms of collusion or not? Um, maybe 55 per se is still relatively, con uh, you know, kind of, difficult to collude, obviously, but remember everything I'm showing you is a lower bound on 
everything, right? Because if some miners are very careful in always keeping their wallets and address separate, I might actually have more than 50, more concentration than the 55, because if, you know, one of them controls four of these addresses, it could even be more concentrated, yeah? Now, so this is one thing to note. The other thing actually to note here is it's not just the level we should be tracking, but the other thing that you see here is that the concentration co-varies with the price of Bitcoin. So in this picture, you see the dotted line is the log of the price of Bitcoin to USD. And what you can see is each time the price of Bitcoin drops, actually concentration goes up. Um, and most likely, right, the, it's the more marginal, the miners that, you know, potentially maybe have not as efficient capacity, mining capacity, they then leave the ecosystem because it's not worth their while anymore, right? But it basically tells you that in times when the price itself drops, maybe for completely idiosyncratic reasons or because Elon Musk tweets something or not, right? But, but the, the price itself also might have an impact on the likelihood of an attack. And that's not great, actually, for a payment system or a ledger, right, that we would like to, to make sure that, they in, that the integrity um, stays actually high, right, throughout, no matter what happens to the price of, the, of that payment system, yeah? Oh, sorry, of, of, that, um, of that ledger, yeah? So this is something that I, I do want to show you because I think it's really important to, to think about this. Um, it also has broader implication for the, for the entire crypto universe because as probably many of you know, right, um, there is mining capacity that can be rented and resold on places like NiceHash and so on. And what we have already seen is that often capacity from the Bitcoin blockchain gets repurposed on other block, much smaller blockchains um, to attack smaller blockchains. Um, because the amount of hashing capacity that is needed to attack something like Litecoin or so on, right, is way less than what is needed to attack Bitcoin. But it just basically tells you that, that t does tell you that we really need to think about this whole ecosystem in a systemic way. Because one thing that you might start being concerned about, right, is that if there is a dominant proof-of-work blockchain like Bitcoin, um, it actually becomes easier to attack and undermine smaller blockchains, which then, of course, has very anti-competitive effects on the entire universe, right? Because then it basically might just um, reassert the dominance of the already dominant blockchain. Right? This is obviously slightly different if we think about proof of stake, and that's a discussion for maybe another reunion, um, hopefully, um, because it's something we are working on. But, but, you know, kind of, so this is actually where I think we still, you know, a lot of work and, and in a way, um, insights need to be generated to really understand, you know, kind of what are also the externalities that um, some... Uh, coins have on the rest of the crypto universe and, and vice versa. With this, let me finish, right, and, and take questions. Um, but just main takeaways, um, I wanted to show you mostly, um, you know, kind of what one can actually use the blockchain data um, to, to, to learn about um, the health, um, the concentration and the overall setup of, of the, the Bitcoin blockchain. Um, and hopefully you also see, right, that um, they are still, in some sense, we are obviously very early in the, in the life of, um, of cryptocurrencies, but there are, if you want, many um, um, areas where um, there is still a lot of work to be done in how to think about the, the integration of these new technologies into our existing financial system. Thank you. So, I think we have 10 minutes for Q&A. Um, go ahead.
So uh, I've presented, thank you. Yeah, so you're right. Um, the, um, I've, we, I've, I've presented or we have presented to the SEC, the CFTC, you know, kind of the Fed. So I'm, you know, kind of talking to many regulators. And as you probably know, um, you know, the SEC in particular, Gary Gensler was a professor here before he be, became the SEC head. And my colleague, Hao Shang Zhu, um, in the finance department actually also just joined the SEC. Um, so yeah, definitely, you know, there, I feel there's a lot to be done in how to um, think about in a smart way um, about regulating the, the space. But you're right, I mean, you know, there's deep fakes and there's in general, if you, I mean, you know, this is something I think um, in society right now, right? If you, you think about how many intermediaries your data is sitting with from you know, your bank to your brokerage account to you know, kind of the airline that you have your miles with and so on, right? Um, and so having a much smarter and more sophisticated way of keeping um, our, identities, our identities safe um, is very important. But I also want to say, right, it's very important here to understand that, um, remember, everything on a permissionless blockchain, everything is actually, people say transparent, but it's all visible. Once I actually break or pierce the, the, the privacy of your wallet or your addresses, everything become, will become visible, right? So that's, for example, why actually the Bitcoin blockchain or any of those blockchains are not GDPR compliant in Europe. Um, be, because of this part of it, right? And we might all feel like, you know, I think we need to say, think much more smartly than this naive way in which is often now being discussed on, on you know, kind of crypto, blo you know, chat functions and so on, right? Um, how people think very naively about privacy, I feel, because, you know, we have to think much smarter about what part of privacy is kind of inconvenient privacy, right? I don't want anyone to see that once in a while I eat, you know, crappy food <laughs> and junk food. That's, you know, my privacy, but nobody is hurt by it, right? But then obviously there are, um, there's a continuation of this if I started to do things that society as a whole would actually li not like to, to engage in, right? And so um, thinking about, you know, where does individual privacy end and where in a way end because it affects public goods that we have in society, right, is, is really something that we have to solve more smartly in general. All right, um, go ahead. Uh, yeah, so good. Um, so the, the question was, you know, why is, is the 51% attack basically a 51% attack? And the reason is, in some sense, let me see if I can quickly go. No, now I can't go back, but it's okay. So, right, if you remember kind of the, the way um, verification on the, on the blockchain works is that basically if you want to send Bitcoin to me, um, in order for the transaction to be encoded in the next block, all the miners that are currently working in verifying that you have that money, it's truly yours, you received it, say, in a past transaction, therefore you can send it to me, right? They all have to agree that actually, right, indeed, this transaction is true. If um, some miners um, do not agree, right, then it, or sorry, if the majority of miners does not agree, then this transaction would not be encrypted in the blockchain. Now, the idea, however, is that if the miners are very, very dispersed and they're just really looking at, look, is this transaction history right? Yes, indeed, he has the money. Now Antoinette can receive it, right? They would very quickly, 51% of them at least would agree, and then it would be encoded, yeah? And so this is the ideal version, world of it. But now imagine that actually there is someone who thinks, wow, um, there's <laughs> money sitting there, that if I now start saying, it's not your money, and therefore you can't send it to Antoinette. You have to, you know, kind of, or because it's not your money, I can, in some sense, um, double spend it, right? Send it to somebody who's my friend and then encode this on the blockchain, right? That would totally undermine the integrity of this blockchain. And so therefore, right, if there suddenly was a dominant set of miners that can do that, 
and serve themselves, right, then that is basically what the double spending attack would be. Yeah? Absolutely. So this is actually a super good question. Very good question. So, you know, the, the question here was, but then why would any miner want to do that, given that it would destroy the value of this blockchain, right? It's a very economist argument that you're making, right? In fact, right, your argument is at the core of proof-of-stake blockchains, right? It's this idea that the people who have to most at stake when they're staking their coins, right, will always want to do the right thing because if they start attacking the blockchain, yeah, then they're destroying their future value. So there are two things that one can say to this. I mean, or where, where you should, where one, where we should all be concerned. One is the following: that if you think about that argument holds, if you, whatever you had to invest in order to do mining doesn't pay for itself immediately, so that you actually still have a lot of stake, right? Because you invested and you need to still get the re return on it. But imagine that you know you have your equipment you have already had the return on it and actually what you can steal could be bigger than whatever you invested right so in those worlds you actually have an incentive to renege because right you are part and but why is your what is actually more subtle in this world is that currently at the current level of the bitcoin blockchain it is probably true that it is in no miner's interest to do this because there is still more at stake than what you can steal, yeah, relative to what you invested in order to have 51 capacity. But this is why it's so important what I showed you about the price dropping. When the price really dropped, that could actually become different. And the, sorry, let me also say, the other place where we have seen this actually becoming more problematic is if you think about DeFi, right? And basically blockchains that have um, smart contracts embedded in it, there often the dApps might become more valuable than the underlying Ethereum blockchain. And if that was to happen, right, then your argument clearly doesn't hold anymore because then actually being able to attack even the apps will create more value than, you know, kind of the underlying blockchain. Now, I know this is a long answer, but it's a really important one. Let me say, say one final thing, which is I think the most, the biggest concern I would have with this is actually non-economic arguments, which is there might be actors in this world that don't care for the continuation value economically, but enjoy creating havoc, right? And so once we go beyond the realm of economics, um, you know, there might be state actors or even non-state actors that don't care if, you know, they invested all this money, but they actually want to wreak havoc, yeah? I think you had a follow-on. Ah, good. Yeah, so I don't know, for some reason I cannot go back, but yeah, so the thing was, so this I didn't want to show you this currently. So we can use this data, ah, thank you. Um, yeah, so we can use this data too, and we did this, to look at where miners are physically located. And the way we can do this is actually because we can see where the miners cash out their coins. Right? Because if you are a U.S.-based miner, you will typically use a U.S.-based exchange because you want U.S. fiat currently. If you're a Japan-based miner, right, you typically use the Japan one and so on. Now, of course, there is Tether and, you know, stable, I mean, in particular Tether, but stablecoin-based um, exchanges where it's a little bit less clear. Um, but it does give us a view into it. And so what we did is, you know, when we do this, so as of the summer of 2021, because this is when we did the original analysis, um, more than 60% of the miners were sitting in China. Um, now what we have seen actually is that, you know, in the fall of 2021, right, Chinese government clamped down on mining. Um, but interestingly, you did see initially actually a drop in, China, in, in mining capacity in China, and some of it, right, famously um, has gone actually to Canada, the US, Indonesia, Kazakhstan, Iran, and so on. But actually China very much recovered too. 
in terms of mining capacity. Um, and some of it, you know, at least from talking to, to you know, people I know in the industry, say that because state governments in China are not so happy of really clamping down on the miners because they benefit from the act business activity that the miners bring to the you know, local governments. Um, but you know, it's true that this type of data does allow us to trace some locations too. And so you know, some, one of the things we have also you know, started doing is to see, for example, you know, in Kazakhstan, there were periods where the government for you know, authoritarian reason shut down the internet for several days. And so then, right, the miners that are sitting in Kazakhstan physically can't do mining when the internet in the whole country is shut down. And so these are the type of things that then allow you um, to identify, you know, certain entities. Yeah? Go ahead. Looking forward, what are some of the biggest unappreciated ways that we can mine? Um, <laughs> yeah, you're asking me to, uh, to be smarter than <laughs> the rest of the economists. Um, so <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, so I think, you know, I feel the, the unappreciated risks um, beyond the ones, you know, we just talked. Um, I think, you know, so one set of risks is indeed that we don't want a world where state governments are starting to undermine each other's blockchain. And we really have to think about how to bring some sensible regulations into this. The, the second thing I'm I, I don't think it's unappreciated because you know it's already coming out. But what really worries me is actually that um, you know we live in a world. I do believe right now in the U.S. where we do try to regulate many things, in particular also financial markets, and we do try to somehow um, take a lot of risk out of the economy and out of transactions in the financial market for for lots of participants. Um, you know, via consumer financial protection and so on. But I think what we have seen in crypto is right now, there is, it's very difficult to do this, right? And it's in particular difficult to do this, say, in DeFi applications. And in why this particular, right? I mean, so, right, you all know probably that there's what is called decentralized finance um, that is built on smart contracts that can be embedded on the more modern blockchains, not Bitcoin, but Ethereum and Solana, Cardano, and so on. But because these are contracts that get automatically executed once they're embedded in the blockchain, and there's no exposed recourse or redress to the legal system, right? If you think about it, these are exactly the situation where everything has to be put in the contract up front. But in a world like this, who benefits? Are the people who know more and who have more experience, right? And the people who know less or have no experience or more marginal, they will be the ones, you know, at risk, if you want. And so those, are, to me, are some of the big issues that we're, you know, we're also starting to experience, right? If you see kind of the, the recent drop in the Bitcoin price, there are even some um, you know, studies now that say in particular minorities and also African Americans were particularly affected by it because many of them bought into crypto at the height of the price because you know we are allowing influencers on their Instagram and what have you accounts to push cryptocurrency on people, right? Um, because it's still this gray area, right? And then again, right, who is most at risk um, of you know of, of falling prey to this are people who normally we would like to financially protect a bit, yeah? Fair enough. Go ahead. Yep, yep. Yeah. Right. So, in a way, what you're saying, maybe, you know, kind of those people that truly want to stay private um, for all these reasons, right, they will be smarter than even what we can do on the blockchain. Absolutely. Right. So, it could be very much an underestimate. That's true, too. And then the other thing that I also have to say is that, you know, this is 
you know, tax evasion is also illegal <laughs> activity, and that I cannot see at all, right? I cannot track in what I have done. So this is obviously a massive undercount if there are people who are not paying capital gains tax and so on on their appreciation, yeah? Absolutely. Could be. I mean, so you know, kind of, I, I, I cannot really, I, I cannot differentiate it, and it is possible, right? And I would say that, you know, kind of one thing we are trying to do, but, you know, kind of, I would say that there are some exchanges. Um, that, you know, kind of over time adopted much more stringent AML and KYC regulation. And we could, we could try to see if the type of flows that they started receiving before and after changes somewhat. But you're right that this will always be an underestimate. I agree. Yep. Okay. Yeah, so I think, you know, the, the question is basically, will this set in motion kind of, uh, you know, that we all come to the lowest common denominator? Um, it's a possibility. I, sorry, let me not say this so flippantly. What, what I mean is, this is really a concern. I do think, though, that, say, the U.S. and, and Europe, for example, as, you know, Western countries that might care about keeping... Um, the financial system, you know, kind of separating tainted from untainted flow, do have a possibility, I believe, in actually setting some standards. And as long, right, as if you think about it, right, it is still the case that the U.S. financial system um, is quite dominant and that a lot of liquidity, you know, and savings and so on are, you know, within the U.S. system. And so if actually enough... Um, you know, if you want, of the critical mass stays here. Um, actually, I think, you know, kind of Western, Western countries have a chance to redefining and in a way getting the network externalities that are so important in finance to actually work in the favor um, of, of some decent regulation. But th there's definitely a risk also that it might go in the other direction. But remember, I think the one thing we should really remember, though, is that I think the average person doesn't want to be like evading and doing crazy things on the blockchain, right? They want a, a, a good interface, um, you know, and as little hassle as possible, and they don't want to live in an unregulated illegal space. So I think, you know, there is actually, there is a lot of, um, how to say, critical mass that wants to do the right thing as long as we have smart regulation that doesn't stand in the way um, of actually doing the right thing, right? I mean, with this, actually, I, I just want to say, you know, I've held you all from your lunch for a long time. I'm happy to talk afterwards, but I want, I know you're all very polite people, so I don't want to keep on working, uh, uh, talking, so I want you to have a chance to go out, but I, I can stay, hang out and answer some questions after that. But thank you very much. <laughs>